Good. So uh, today I want to finish up on structure drawing and get at this idea of that there's many, many, many correct ways to draw any given structure. And that's going to require some practice on your part. Uh, but it means that the way to approach learning how to draw structures does not involve uh, memorizing what I've drawn on the screen. That's not the way to go about this. It's going to take some practice. And uh, the good news is I think you'll get plenty of that on OWL. The bad news is the uh, structure drawing tool on OWL has its own set of problems. I think you guys will get used to it. Uh, but um, it does bring it, its own issues, I will admit that. Uh, but I want to uh, get through some more examples of structure drawing and especially hit this idea of isomerism, at least constitutional isomers, which is going to come up pretty quickly. And I think now's as good a time as any to go over that. Uh, I would also like to review about electronegativity about, uh, and about polarity, both polarity of bonds and polarity of molecules as a whole. This is a topic that you covered in Gen Chem, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. Um, and then we'll end up today with a discussion of resonance, which is something also covered in Gen Chem. But in my experience, uh, this is an extremely difficult concept to grasp. And so, and when I say that, I mean, I, I have to work very hard to this day, you know, whatever, 25, 30 years later for me. It, I just, it's something I have to keep reminding myself of and, uh, and really stay on my toes with. So we'll get to that. And uh, I can also give you guys the good news that we did a reef pulling thing in the previous class and it worked. So uh, it, it worked pretty well for us the other day. We'll do it here again. This will again not count for a grade today, but we'll get to that later. The first time it will count for a grade will be Wednesday. So if you don't have your uh, reef app up and running yet today, that's fine. You won't be penalized. But on Wednesday, uh, it will be for all the marbles. But let's get through uh, this issue of structure drawing first. So over here, I've drawn a molecule, happens to be called 1-propanol. I don't really care if you know that right now. Uh, we'll learn little by little how to name uh, different types of molecules with different functional groups. Uh, but this molecule is the formula, unless I've completely lost it, C3H8O. And what we find is that there's more than one way to, uh, to make a molecule with different atom attachments that has that formula. And so that, that uh, what, what, we, what we call that, that's the phenomenon of isomerism, in particular um, uh, constitutional isomerism. The idea that you can have two molecules that have the same molecular formula, but the atoms are connected differently. It's a very, very common thing in organic chemistry. This is one way to connect uh, three carbons, eight hydrogens, and one oxygen. This over here is another way. And I think you can convince yourself very quickly that these two molecules are different from one another. Uh, well, it's not if you failed to open the reef app at the beginning. I don't think so. Uh, the, qu the question on chat is if you failed to open the reef app at the beginning of class. I don't think so. I think you can open it at any time. Uh, I haven't really started it yet. I've just, opened the, I've just opened my app over here. But I think you're able to open it at any time. <clears throat> so certainly let me know if that doesn't work, because I would want to know. Uh, okay, so where were we? So both of these molecules with the same formula, C3H8O, but the atoms are connected differently. And uh, so, so I think that's about all we need to say about that. Uh, but this over here, the way I've drawn this molecule here, you'll notice I've drawn out all of the atoms and bonds explicitly. And that's not wrong. It's one of several correct ways to draw this molecule. But I think you'll find after you get to about four carbons approximately, it begins to be really tedious to draw out all those bonds. You still can. It's not wrong. But at some point, I think you'll find it's just too much trouble. So we need some ways to abbreviate that. We need some ways to, uh, to make our lives easier. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and so to abbreviate those structures. So one way to abbreviate structures 
is by what is known as condensing them using condensed structures. And so this CH3 over here represents that CH3 there. Uh, let's do this one in red. Here we have a CH2. So there's CH2. And then we'll go back to green. This CH2 over here is this CH2 over here. So that's one way to do it. And by the way, with carbon, we have to be flexible. You'll also see like H3C instead of CH3. That's fine. We can be flexible with carbon because carbon is four bonds. And so when you try to draw something with four bonds to it in a linear fashion like this, you, you've got to allow for some flexibility like that. Uh, likewise, if you want to draw the bonds in between the carbons and the carbon and the oxygen, you can. You don't have to, but you can. It's allowed. Uh, with the oxygen, though, we can afford to be pickier because oxygen is only two bonds. So that's why I've written CH3, CH2, CH2, OH, as opposed to CH2, HO, right? Because that would seem to imply that the oxygen is sticking out on the end. So with oxygen, we can afford to be picky and show where that point of connection is. Carbon, we're a little more flexible with, since there, there's, it's not, there's not one necessarily clearly best way to show all four, to condense all four bonds in like that. Uh, so these two molecules I said, oops, equal Z. These two molecules I said are isomers, specifically constitutional isomers. Uh, I think they're also called structural isomers. One thing, by the way, you probably noticed this about chemists in general when you took Gen Chem. Chemists seem to love it when there's like two or three names for the exact same thing. And I'm sorry to tell you, but organic chemists are even worse in that regard. We're just never satisfied unless there's two or even three terms that mean the exact same thing. So you'll, I promise you, you'll see that repeatedly as this term goes on the next term as well. So uh, that being said, what about these two structures over here? Whoops, control Z. Thank goodness for control Z. Well, I hope you can convince yourself that this structure is the same thing. It's just another way of drawing that. The way you know that is because everything's connected the same. You've got a CH2 between another CH2 and an OH, CH2, OH, and CH2. This CH2 is between the previous CH2 and CH3. Everything's connected the same way. So this is just another way of, saying this, of stating the same thing, of, of showing the same molecule. And that's something you're going to need to get used to, how to tell the difference between two molecules uh, uh, OCF comparing. Compare. There we go. Uh, so th that's important to be able to tell the difference between when two structures are of the same molecule or of different molecules. And you'll get to practice that on out. Like I said, if you have any issues on that or want to ask anything about that, feel free to, to bring that to all this out. It's not a problem. But um, let's see. So this is one way of abbreviating the, dang it, <laughs> this structure over here. So, uh, and that's not the only correct way to do it. But that's, that's one of my main messages to you guys today. There are many, many, many correct ways to draw any given structure. Maybe today, for whatever reason, uh, you feel like drawing this guy vertically. CH3, CH2, O, CH3. Sure, same thing. Uh, the question comes up here, and it's, it's sort of a, a leading edge for me in terms of things I'm working on. I, uh, I know that I have a reputation for not responding well to questions like this, which is, if this is the answer on an exam and we draw it this way, will we lose points? And uh, it's like I said, that's my problem. That's not your problem. I need to learn how to deal with questions like that better. That being said, uh, I will let you guys know also, questions like that are, I don't believe they're the best way forward for you guys because you're not going to master the material by, as it were, memorizing a bunch of rules. That being said, I understand the spirit behind that question. And every once in a while, the answer to that question turns out to be especially interesting. And this is one of those times. So if this is the answer to a question in the exam and you put that, will you lose points? 
Notice my answer. My answer to the question in this case is not only will you not lose points, but I wouldn't even notice. And I think that answer can actually help you guys out. It means that if, if I saw this in the answer box, I would just immediately see that it's the same thing and move on. So what that means is that you guys need to practice until you're at the point where you can see that these two are the same thing or those two are the same thing. That's what it means for you. So there's many, many correct ways to draw any given structure of any given molecule, all of which would be accepted. And I, I wouldn't even see them as being different. Now, can we take this one step further? Can we abbreviate even further? Uh, oh, before we do that, though, uh, before we get to line angle drawings, in Gen Chem, uh, your professor might have been okay with things like this, where you just put sticks in, and it was assumed that the sticks went to H's. I am not a fan of that. Please don't do that. The rule that I like to give is if you draw letter C's for the carbon atoms, then you need to show all the H's explicitly, either you know, with each bond like this, or you can condense, of course. But if you draw letter C's for the carbon atoms, then you need to show all the H's explicitly, or you show, the, show the hydrogens explicitly, either with bonds like this, or you can condense, which already begs the question, is there a way of drawing organic structures without drawing letter C's for carbon? The answer is yes. Those are called line angle drawings or skeletal structures. There you go. Again, two terms that mean the exact same thing. Why? I don't know. I, I bet you could find a textbook somewhere that has yet a third term that means the exact same thing. Uh, what about fissure projections? Oh, you're, you're way ahead of us here. Uh, fissure projections are, uh, they will become useful for us at first, I think, in chapter three. I think that's right. And, 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 and they're, they're just used to communicate a particular set of properties of a structure. But we'll get to those. Those come up in chapter three, I think. Uh, good. So, line angle drawings. So, the idea behind line angle drawings is that we draw a geometric figure such that every sharp corner or sharp point is assumed to be a carbon atom. And so this is one way to draw one propanol, to draw that molecule. And so the idea behind it is, for example, over here, I see a sharp point over here. That's going to be a carbon atom. And so since I see one bond coming away from that carbon atom, well, that means there's three more bonds that aren't being shown. And so those must be the hydrogens. And so, for, uh, and so you could say that this carbon here re uh, represents the CH3 group, the methyl group, as we'll soon learn CH3 is called. Uh, this kink in the chain over here, well, there's a, there's a corner there. And coming out from that corner, I see two bonds. One is going to the oxygen. One is going to this carbon back here. So sure enough, that refers to, or that represents this CH2. And then again, this carbon over here, once again, you can see there's two bonds that are explicitly shown. Those are both carbon-carbon bonds. And the other two bonds that aren't shown are to hydrogens. Now you could show the bonds to hydrogen, H, H. You can do, it makes that noise up there. You can do that if you want to, it's not wrong. It's just you don't have to. And that's the real strength of line angle drawings. Is, is the bonds to hydrogen are assumed. One thing that I've, I've learned uh, sometimes causes people to stumble. Now notice this sharp corner over here. That's not a carbon there. That's the end of the carbon-oxygen bond. It's showing that it's bonded to the oxygen. So when, when you have another atom there that's explicitly given like that, then that's how you show that. So, that, so this line here is the carbon-oxygen bond. Uh, how would we draw this guy, the ethyl methyl ether, as we'll learn that's called, using a line angle drawing? Well, you could do something like this. It looks a little funny. I mean, it's, it's not wrong. It's completely acceptable. I, I don't tend to like the, these sticks hanging out. I just find it a little confusing. If it were me, I'd probably write CH3 there. But you don't have to. If, if you had what I originally had, that would also be fine. I'm sure that Owl would understand that. 
all right, I think that probably, most likely, Owl will understand and accept that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you'll learn how to work with Owl over here. Uh, but um, what this gets to is, I think what you'll find as time goes on is each one of you will develop your own style, almost, as to how you draw structures. Myself, I tend to use a mix of line angle drawings and condensed structures, but there's many, many correct ways to draw any given structure, all of which will be understood and taken into account. So all corners are carbons, yes. So this is a carbon over here, this is a carbon over here. Now, this is the end of the carbon oxygen bond. This is the end of the carbon oxygen bond. So when it's, it's explicitly bonded to some other atom, then that's not another carbon crammed in there. That's just showing the end of the bond from carbon to that atom. So I think you'll notice another thing about all this. Uh, you'll notice that I'm, uh, I'm giving it, I would say, my best good faith effort at showing correct bond angles here. So I'm showing that that's like 109.5 degrees. Uh, the correct bond angle of an sp3 hybridized atom. Uh, the, I, I always make a little agreement with my students, and the agreement we make is I promise not to get out a protractor on you as long as you don't get out a protractor on me. You know, you're not going to go in there, oh, that the, you failed, it's 107 degrees. Close enough. I think you can see that I made my best good faith effort. Certainly that's an angle that's greater than 90 degrees. And so I'm trying my best to show correct bond angles. You would show 120 degree angles within reason if, you, if you've got an sp2 hybridized carbon and you'd show the bond angle being 180 degrees linear if it were an sp hybridized carbon, like in acetylene, right? Those two carbons are sp hybridized. And again, I think you'll agree, I'm reasonably close to linear. Maybe it's 178 degrees, but close enough, I think you'll agree. So if someone were to put, whoops, that, would I take off points? Maybe. I don't know that I'd take off 50 points, maybe one or two. But I think you'll agree this is not as good as this, especially if the question refers to showing the correct molecular geometry. So try, you know, put in, your, put in a reasonable good faith effort at showing the correct bond angles. And it just makes it easier also, uh, also, to, uh, also with these line angle drawings. If you're just drawing condensed structures, maybe we don't focus so much on bond angles. But all of these are correct ways to, to draw those two compounds. These two are isomers. One propanol, and that one's called methyl ethyl ether. Again, I don't care if you know that at this point. Uh, that being said, I'll let you know uh, for the curious, there's actually yet one more isomer of that molecule. And you, you, it would not be a waste of your time to see if you can come up with that structure. I'll even give you a big hint, that molecule is something you can buy bottles of at the supermarket. It's isopropanol, rubbing alcohol. So you might want to see if you can come up with that one. But I think those are the only three. Yeah, I think this is the only possible ether and then you've got the two alcohols. We'll get to functional groups pretty soon also. Uh, good. So far, so good. Any questions so far? I could develop eyes in the back of my head. Be the check. Okay. You're talking about a double bond? Well, Uh, I don't even know that with only two carbons, you almost wouldn't draw it with line angle drawings. Uh, but uh, I could imagine something like this. Oh, I don't know. It's a little weird, but you can draw alkynes like that. This would be a, these, these would be carbons in here, this would be a CH3, and this over here is a double bond. Yep. And, and by the way, we're going to practice this in our uh, clicker session today. So I have a question like this coming up. But, and, and you will get lots of, you will, you will have this coming out of your ears when you get to the owl side. Good. Other questions then? 
where are we at? 12.25, we have till 12.50. Good. Uh, I think that will do for now. Um, so let me just remind you of, I don't know how much I have to write about this, but let me just remind you about some things on uh, electronegativity and uh, struct, uh, electronegativity and bond polarity and all this. It's a chapter, that, or rather it's a topic you covered in Gen Chem, uh, but you might, I, hopefully you guys recall that electronegativity is the ability of an atom to, and I have this definition in the class notes, but it's the ability of an atom to uh, attract towards itself bonding electrons. The idea is there's going to be a tug of war between two atoms that are bonded together. And if, one, uh, and if one of them is significantly more electronegative than the other, then that one is winning the tug of war for the electrons. More of that electron density is moving towards the more electronegative atom. Now, uh, electronegativity, first of all, uh, does have, um, does have uh, how do you put it, a quantitative a uh, set of numbers to go with it. You'll find a table of Pauling electronegativity values in your book. They were developed by the late Linus Pauling, a uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, chemist. Of course, I do not expect you to memorize all those numbers. I, I hope one thing you're learning about me by now is I'm not a big fan of making students just memorize a bunch of numbers. I can hardly think of a, a worse use of your time than that. Uh, um, if, uh, that, if you need any of those numbers, let's say for an owl question, I, 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 they should supply any data that you need. If not, go ahead and look it up in your book. Uh, that being said, uh, I would say there's two things that are worth knowing. One is that carbon and hydrogen have about the same electronegativity. One of them is 2.1 and one's 2.5, and I can never remember which myself. But I think you'll agree those are pretty close. Uh, only I could pull up um, uh, a periodic table. So uh, we'll have our imaginary periodic table here on the screen. Uh, I think another worthwhile thing to understand uh, is the general trends of electronegativity on the periodic table. I think it's worth being aware that electronegativity increases from left to right. First of all, it increases from left to right in the periodic table, that makes sense, right? Because on the left of the periodic table, that's your metals. Metals are very electropositive. So as you go from left to right, uh, the electronegativity increases. And electronegativity also increases up the periodic table. So the most electronegative element that we're likely to be dealing with is going to be fluorine, right? Because the noble gases don't count. Those don't form covalent bonds. So fluorine is our most electronegative element and what's going to be the least electronegative element that we might actually use. Maybe potassium, maybe cesium, one of these uh, alkali metals, maybe. So I think, I think being aware of the trends is really great. I would never ask you on an exam, what is the pollen electronegativity of nitrogen? No, no way. I would never do that to you guys. Now, it would be really great if you knew that nitrogen was more electronegative than carbon. That would be great or that oxygen is more electronegative still, that's worth knowing. But exact numbers, no, please don't bother. That being said, in Gen Chem, you use those Pauling electronegativity values to classify bonds as falling into one of three categories. At least this is how I did it when I taught Gen Chem. I imagine it was pretty similar for you guys. And those three categories would be nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and ionic. And your book no doubt had these these cutoff numbers. And by the way, those numbers are completely bogus. You know, they're, 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 they're at least to an extent arbitrary. There is a continuum between an electronegativity difference of zero, like say in the Br2 molecule. That's a completely nonpolar covalent bond because the electronegativity difference is zero. And at the other extreme, you have something like uh, the difference in electronegativity between sodium and fluorine or potassium and fluorine. This difference is so great that that's not a covalent bond. And that's why sodium fluoride and potassium fluoride are ionic compounds. There's essentially no covalent character. And then you've got this grade in the middle, you know, where, where bonds can be, uh, can be covalent but still fairly polarized. And you have carbon-oxygen bonds, carbon-halogen bonds, right, carbon-nitrogen bonds. 
And it's good to be able to pick those out in a structure. I don't care if you know the exact electronegativity values, but it'd be really great if your eye is kind of drawn to those places in the structure. Why? Because we're going to find before long that probably that's going to be a place where chemistry happens. So it's good to be able to pick those out. Beyond that, uh, if you're aware that carbon-carbon uh, and carbon-hydrogen bonds are quite nonpolar, I think that's also worth knowing, but certainly nothing to do with memorizing particular numbers. Likewise, now that we understand something about um, uh, uh, bond polarity, there's also such a thing, which again you covered in Gen Chem, uh, as polarity of a molecule as a whole. And the way you work that out is you consider, first of all, what the shape of the molecule is. You have to get the correct shape according to uh, the VSEPR model, or you cannot correctly predict polarity. So that part has to be correct. Uh, and then what you do is you take into account all of the different individual bond polarities. And the question is, are there any that are left uh, in, uh, unsymmetrically in the molecule, kind of uncompensated, or do all of them cancel each other out? So, uh, for example, let me go back to my whiteboard. Uh, so, for example, if we considered a molecule like carbon tetrachloride, here I'm drawing it in its correct three-dimensional geometry. This is not the only way to do it. There are other, whoops, whoa, getting ahead of myself. Uh, there are other correct ways to show that tetrahedral shape, but this is one of them. That's a chlorine, by the way. Uh, this is a molecule where you've got four carbon-chlorine bonds. Those bonds are quite polar, because chlorine's a good deal more electronegative than carbon. But as a whole, the molecule is nonpolar because all of those bond polarities cancel. So uh, there's a table of, of uh, molecular polarities measured in Debye units. I hope you're already guessing. Of course, I do not expect you to memorize all those numbers. Certainly take a look at the table and you'll see that as a molecule gets more polar, then that can be measured quantitatively, but I would never do that to you. What is the polarity of methanol in Dubai units? No way, of course not. I'm not interested in your memorizing numbers. Uh, but that's the meaning of that table. The, the uh, overall uh, polarity of carbon tetrachloride would be zero, zero Dubai, because everything cancels. Now, that being said, as you saw from my getting ahead of myself over there, what if we did that? Now everything changes. Now this molecule does have an overall dipole moment. I don't know what it is exactly, and I wouldn't expect you to either. But now all of those uh, individual bond polarities do not cancel out. And actually, as I have it drawn here, uh, the overall direction of polarity of the molecule is coming out of the screen at us. Uh, because the, the, the three chlorine atoms lie in front of that plane. Uh, so, you know, uh, but, I, but this molecule is polar as a whole, whereas that's chloroform, by the way, whereas carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar. So I'm just mentioning this in case you guys need to go back and review any of this. It's, it's worth being able to tell whether a molecule is polar or not. That's going uh, to give us a lot of information about how to pick the correct solvent for a reaction. So it's going to come into play. So you covered it in Gen Chem, but I just thought I'd bring that up uh, so you were aware of the issue. Good. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to switch to uh, our clicker session. Again, this does not count for a grade today. Uh, we tested this out already uh, with um, uh, uh, the, with our previous class and everything worked fine. So, uh, so this is uh, set up for, does it even if I just tap it? No, that doesn't work. Uh, yeah. Ooh, wait a minute. Struggling here. So uh, today we'll just, uh, uh, I, I could have given you uh, multiple choice questions and you put your answer A, B, C, D, E. Let's just register our attendance, just press A, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't count for a grade.
So if you don't have your Reef app set up yet, that's fine, but you know, try to get that taken care of by Wednesday, because on Wednesday, it will count. And I, I see there's 80 odd responses, and it looks like you guys in chat, I assume that's working too. Everyone should be getting feedback also. Yes, your answer was accepted type thing. So, so all this works just fine. Another thing I'll let you guys know, I always put up usually after the fact, not this time, this time it's already on the campus, but generally at least after the fact, I will put the clicker session or the reef polling sessions on the campus. And I include the answers, which I also did uh, this time. So uh, maybe we won't spend class time on this, but, um, but uh, I, I've already given the answer here. Uh, these are, these are just a couple of the many, many correct ways to, to, uh, to the, that are alternate ways of drawing that molecule. Oh, that reminds me of something else. A question I often get now, and again, it's a fair question, because how can you be born knowing this? You'll notice that I'm putting the non-bonding lone pairs in the oxygen. So in answer to the inevitable question, will you lose points if you don't put the non-bonding lone pairs? For now, at least, I'm going to say yes, just to be on the safe side. Certainly for now, until we're getting used to drawing structures, let's say certainly through the first exam, let's, let's be careful to show explicitly all non-bonding lone pairs, wherever they may need to be. After that point, we might begin to relax that somewhat. There, there comes a point, you know, as you can imagine, if you have eight chlorines and three oxygens in the molecule, you're going to be sitting there, you know, putting all these dots in. And it does get a little bit tedious if there's, there's no real extra information. But for now, let's be careful to draw in uh, all non-bonding lone pairs. Make sense? Good, so this, this is already on campus. You can go and review this, uh, this, uh, this question and the answer if you like. So the only other really important topic that's related to this is we've got to get into the animal life that's at my house. So that's Bella. Uh, Bella turned 14 years old in May, and she'll be 15 this coming May, and so far seems to be doing pretty well, uh, except that she has no teeth. Poor Bella, I had to have them all removed. Poor kitty. She's fine. She's fine. She eats dry cat food. God knows how. I don't know how she does it. I guess she just uh, inhales it. And as you can see, she's certainly not starving, so, uh, so she's fine. Uh, Bella's real easy to explain. Uh, Bella is dumb as a rock and loves everybody. She, she's much too dumb to be afraid of anyone. She loves everybody. And so that's why you might have heard in past semesters, um, we would have Bella Day. It would be the reading day of finals week. And I would bring Bella into my office and people would come over to my office if they wanted to, as long as they're not allergic. And, and Bella really enjoys that. She loves it. She just loves everybody. Obviously, we didn't do that last term. Obviously, we're not doing that this term. But as long as there is a Bella, uh, then we will continue having Bella Day. Questions from chat. Are the clicker questions always from the current lecture, or will there be questions from previous lectures or topics? Could be from a previous lecture. I mean, within reason. I don't think I'd take something from three weeks ago. But yeah, it would probably be that current lecture or, or maybe a, a relatively recent one. Uh, good, so that's, that's one animal. Uh, the recent addition is Barnaby, or in this case, unfortunately, it's more like Blurnaby. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm not real good at it. I got to get better pictures of this. But I uh, adopted Barnaby about two months ago. Interestingly, uh, pretty much the exact same week that I got the positive test for COVID. So that was, that was an interesting week. But uh, uh, Barnaby's a good kitty. Uh, he's somewhat more timid. Uh, he looks like a Siamese cat. But uh, if you take a close look at him, he doesn't at all of the body or face type of a Siamese cat. So I'm sure he's a mutt of some kind. But he's a good kitty. Uh, so, so Bella loves everyone, except she's not so sure about Barnaby, but we're working on that. And so much for the uh, 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 animal life at my house. So um, let's see. Uh, that's, yeah, that's going to give me an error message. With that, um, uh, I just wanted, I, I, I guess the reason I had the class notes open, oh, I guess we can stop this too. So, uh, yep, that all looks like it's performing as advertised. 
well, I'm going to do, this does not mean we're ending class now. I mean, I'm ending the re-polling session. Class is still going on for another 10 minutes or so. Uh, good. So, yeah, so those are, those are my kitties. Uh, yeah, because I, I, I actually had two cats for a while. I had a younger cat who unfortunately got real sick uh, in 2018, I guess, and they had to have him put to sleep. I would love to tell you that Bella ever showed any sign of missing him. Nope. <laughs> so that's why I got another cat. It's better. They can keep each other company. Good. So I, I do want to point out that I have things like uh, the formula for formal charges here in the class notes. I don't know that you'll really need to memorize that. I, I mean, you can if you want to. Probably after you get enough experience drawing structures, you'll be able to remember things like that. The reason I'm bringing that up is because our final topic today is going to be uh, resonance, which again is a topic that you covered in Gen Chem, but uh, it's particularly tricky. And so I've got about, oh, 10 minutes uh, on Tom Barnaby. Is that like a person whose name I should know? <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, you can explain the joke later. So, um, resonance, I, I have the definition for you in the class notes. If I had to, to define it off the top of my head in my own words, I would say resonance is a phenomenon uh, where you've got a molecule for which there's more than one correct way to distribute all of those valence electrons. Remember, we have to account for all of the valence electrons when we draw the structure. And sometimes there's more than one correct way of doing that without moving any atoms. That part's very important. You're not allowed to move atoms. But even with keeping all of the atoms in the same place, uh, the accepted answer would have to be the actual structure, not just the formula. Well, it depends what the question's asking. But when you're asked for the structure of something, yes, you would want to, to, you would want to put the structure, in, in, at least in, in, in any one of those correct ways. So uh, getting to resonance, you know, we've got plenty of molecules like, I don't know, ammonia. Ammonia has eight valence electrons to account for. Those are they, and that's the only correct way to do it. Now, I, I'm here not showing the pyramidal geometry of the molecule, right? I'm just drawing the flat structure. Uh, but, uh, but that is a molecule that does not exhibit resonance. There are other ones, methane would be the same, water would be the same. These molecules don't exhibit resonance. There's only one correct way to distribute all of the valence electrons. But what about a molecule like benzene? Benzene is C6H6, and we will learn more about the chemistry of benzene actually next term in, I think, chapter 13. Uh, well, what I just do here. Uh, benzene, as I said, is C6H6. So uh, if I were to draw a line angle drawing, it might look something like this. So there is one hydrogen attached to each of the six carbons going around the outside. Uh, and they're, they're uh, understood to be there. Again, you could draw them out if you wanted to. It's just not necessary. But there is another way I could have distributed those, in particular, those six pi electrons in the three double bonds. That's pretty awful. Let me at least try to make it the same size. Jeez. At least close to the same size. So that's another correct way to distribute the electrons. And so benzene is a molecule that exhibits resonance. And the way we show that is with this special double-headed single arrow. Please note well, this is not an equilibrium arrow. That's a totally different critter. So this double-headed single arrow is what we use to show that this is a molecule that exhibits resonance. And so what that means, uh, it, 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 there they go with moving the bonds. I totally get it. We'll get to that. The, the, the trick, that, that, that then is the tricky part. Uh, we're not really moving anything. So resonance is a phenomenon. Now I can't remember if I actually got through the definition, so let me make sure I do that. Resonance is a phenomenon when there's more than one correct way to distribute all of the electrons without moving any of the atoms. So you're not allowed to move any atomic nuclei. And so uh, the thing that makes resonance hard 
uh, and I have to remind myself of this to this day. I'm not just saying that. that's really true. It's something I have to to keep to keep uh, to keep sharp about. Uh, the the way to think about a molecule like benzene is not that it's flipping back and forth rapidly between these two structures. That is not the way to think about benzene. It is not, resonance is not an equilibrium. There's nothing flipping back and forth. Nor should we think of a sample of benzene as the rule about not moving atoms includes rotation. That is correct. You're not allowed to move atoms at all. But you, sometimes you find there's more than one correct way to distribute the electrons. Again, not for ammonia, not for methane, not for water. For benzene, yes. And you'll run across some other examples of that in your travels. But um, so benzene is not flipping back and forth between those two structures, however rapidly you like. It's also not the case that if you took a beaker of benzene, half the molecules would be like this and half would be like that. That is not the way to think about it. Rather, the correct understanding of a resonance stabilized species like benzene is that every molecule is at all times a mixture of those two structures, or a hybrid, it's sometimes called. If I had to give you uh, um, oh, uh, an analogy, the, the analogy I usually give, it's a little cheesy, but it works. Uh, if we were to say that this resonance contributor to benzene is blue and this resonance contributor to benzene is yellow, we mustn't think that the, the molecules are flipping back and forth between blue and yellow or that half of them are blue and half of them are yellow. Rather, every single benzene molecule is at all times green. At all times. If you stop time and you shrunk yourself down to benzene molecule size, and you took a look at a benzene molecule, it would be green. And there are other molecules that have this property too. Uh, but, but benzene is usually the one that's given as an example. Now, uh, or here's another way of thinking about it. And again, it's, it's kind of a difficult concept, but it's one we've got to get down. Benzene is a molecule that has one true structure that is best understood as being at all times a mixture or hybrid of those two structures. Now, when we draw benzene, because we're drawing benzene molecules, because doesn't everyone, uh, if you're in a situation, then I don't care which of those you use. The rule that you need to know for, uh, and this will apply all the way through organic too, when you're dealing with a resonance stabilized molecule, you can pick whichever you like of the resonance forms. It doesn't matter. Uh, that's not to say that sometimes people don't try to show what that one true structure would look like. Uh, you will sometimes see benzene drawn something like this with a circle in the middle. And that circle is kind of nice in one sense. It's a nice reminder that all of these six pi electrons are smeared evenly around that six-membered ring. Uh, if you were to think of benzene as having neither single bonds nor double bonds between the carbons, but six equal one and a half bonds, you would be pretty much on target. That is not wrong. And this is an attempt to show that. And in so doing, it's not so bad. Uh, the one real weakness, though, of the circle is how many electrons are in a circle. It's not clear. So I don't really care which of these ways of drawing benzene you use. Uh, I will let you know, I think on exams you'll find one of those two, because I, I use a, a program called ChemDraw to put the structures in, same thing in your class notes. And for some reason they've made it kind of hard to draw benzene with a circle. So you'll probably see one of these structures. But, uh, but, uh, but, but that's the thing to understand about resonance. If we can get that down today, I'll be pretty happy. So remember, resonance is a phenomenon that occurs sometimes, not always, but sometimes, in which there is more than one correct way to distribute all of the valence electrons when you draw the structure. And all of those correct ways, well, are correct. Uh, and uh, when you're dealing with a resonance stabilized species like benzene, there are others that you'll, you'll get to see some examples. I just am kind of running out of time here. But it, I, I don't care which of the resonance forms you use. But do bear in mind, it's a difficult concept. Resonance is not an equilibrium. 
It's not flipping back and forth or 50-50. Every molecule is at all times a mixture, a hybrid of those two structures, at all times. That's the part that's hard to understand. So please always remind yourself, because I promise I'm always reminding myself, that resonance is not an equilibrium. There's nothing flipping back and forth. Now, in my waning minute, last minute here, I'll just mention this is always the place where they bring up uh, arrow pushing as a tool to help yourself find other resonance forms. And so you'll see this brought up here in your book. Uh, Arrow pushing turns out to be very important for us. Curved arrow notation, it's also called. There is but one rule uh, for drawing arrows, and we'll get into this more in detail next time. But the rule is um, that the electron pair starts here. It starts at the tail of the arrow. And the electron pair ends at the head of the arrow. Pair ends. And we're going to use arrow pushing quite a lot to help us understand organic reactions. And I, I do see a question on, uh, 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 actually, it's a, it's a Schrodinger's cat. Oh, no. They're, they're discussing it amongst themselves. But anyway, we're going to use arrow pushing in its correct usage in order to show what happens during a chemical reaction. I believe we'll already start that next time with acid-base chemistry. Uh, the reason it's kind of bad, kind of bogus to use it with resonance is because, as they're discussing in chat, no electrons are actually moving. So it's bogus because there's really no electrons shifting around. But it is permitted, it is sometimes done to use arrow notation as a tool to help you find other resonance forms. Uh, but unfortunately, it's kind of bogus. We're going to start learning about uh, arrow pushing as a tool to understand reaction mechanisms next time. And that is not bogus at all. With that, I'm kind of out of time. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. So have a great day. We'll see you all on Wednesday.